January 31st, 1977, the Mojave Desert. Space Shuttle Orbiter 101 is being transported from its assembly facility in Palmdale, California, 35 miles overland to NASA's Dryden Flight Research Center at Edwards Air Force Base. This orbiter, named Enterprise, is the first of a fleet of reusable space transports. Like nothing ever before built, the shuttle orbiter is a hybrid, part spacecraft, part airplane. Upon returning from space, the orbiter, with no air-breathing engines, will be flown to a powerless landing, like a glider. Now, performance and reliability must be proven in the approach and landing tests of the orbiter Enterprise. For testing, the 75-ton spacecraft will be carried atop a 747 jumbo jet to an altitude of about five miles, then released by firing a set of explosive bolts. The test will be carried out in three stages. The captive inert phase, with no orbiter crew aboard, then the captive active and the free flight stages, both with astronaut crews at the orbiter controls. Taxi runs begin the captive inert testing in which the orbiter stays atop the carrier aircraft and none of the orbiter's systems are turned on. The big 747 is maneuvered along the runway at speeds up to 157 miles an hour to determine steering, braking, and ground handling characteristics while carrying the orbiter. Next, a series of six captive inert flights is scheduled, still with the orbiter unmanned and its systems inactive. 747 Captain Fitz Fulton and co-pilot Tom McMurtry will fly the carrier aircraft as chase planes help monitor the operation. Their mission is to obtain information on performance of the mated vehicles. is much closer to that of a standard 747 than expected. Subsequent captive inert flights check for stability and control problems and accomplish flutter tests. Flutter is a term for high frequency oscillation which can build up in aircraft parts causing structural failure. The orbiter's position atop the carrier aircraft changes the normal airflow around the 747 tail reducing stability and causing tail buffet. For this reason, special fins resembling outriggers have been added to the horizontal stabilizer to restore directional stability. A tail cone fitted to the orbiter and covering its three main engines allows it to be carried higher while reducing 747 tail buffeting. After separation, since the tail cone also reduces air drag on the orbiter, it will be able to descend more slowly allowing more time for testing in flight. A tail cone will also be used to reduce tail buffet on ferry flights when the 747 transports orbiters from California to the launch facility in Florida. But for space missions, the orbiter's engines will be left exposed and the vehicle will re-enter the atmosphere and land without a tail cone. The captive inert flights continue with technical evaluations Emergency descent is simulated. Finally, all procedures up to the point of actual release of the orbiter are carried out. The testing goes so well that flight number six is not required. The captive active phase can begin with the orbiter crew aboard and the orbiter systems active. Astronaut crews have been training for the approach and landing tests. A shuttle training aircraft, or STA, is constructed by modifying a Gulfstream II airplane to handle like an orbiter. Inside, the left seat and controls are changed. Computer equipment is added. In the STA, a crew practices landings. Spacecraft Commander Fred Hayes 
Time spacecraft pilot Gordon Fullerton. Briefings are held on orbiter systems with another crew. Spacecraft Commander Joe Engel and spacecraft pilot Dick Truly. At the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, a computer-controlled trainer, the Orbiter Aeroflight Simulator, or OAS, is used to practice landings. Orbiter crews operate the controls, causing a special television camera to scan a scale model of the dry lake bed on which the orbiter will land at Edwards Air Force Base. The result, a realistic orbiter landing, is seen through the simulator windows. Here coming. The crews are well prepared. Astronauts Hayes and Fullerton will fly the first captive active test, alternating the missions with Engel and Truly. The control room at Dryden Flight Research Center manages operations before the flight and maintains contact with the carrier aircraft. It will also serve as a contingency control room in case communication should be lost with the control center in Houston. The control center is the recovery operations control room at Johnson Space Center, the same control room used for recovery operations during the Apollo program. The orbiter's fuel cells are active now, furnishing 15,000 watts of electricity for coolant systems, communication equipment, and flight control systems, including the five onboard computers. Four of these computers are redundant, working together as a set, comparing information when asked to make a decision. If failures occur, normal operation can still continue with as few as two of them functioning. Finally, the crew can fly the orbiter using the fifth computer only if the redundant set fails. Well, I think, okay, I didn't really think I Other power is furnished by special hydraulic turbines called auxiliary power units, or APUs. They supply energy for mechanical functions, such as moving the flight control surfaces. It is during these captive active flights that problems occur with the power units. A sensor shows excessive temperature in the APU system but a later check reveals that it was accidentally triggered by a loose wire. The wire is replaced. Another power unit problem surfaces. A seal in a bellows unit is leaking, allowing APU fuel to drain overboard. The bellows, already being redesigned, is replaced by a modified unit, and the system is safe. Three captive active flights are made so that problems like these can be discovered and corrected. The last captive active flight includes a full rehearsal for the separation maneuver. The 747 crew pushes over and accelerates the mated pair to 310 miles an hour. They are descending at 3,000 feet per minute. The orbiter's elevons and ailerons are positioned to provide the correct angle and lift for the actual release. The next phase of the approach and landing tests. Astronauts Fred Hayes and Gordon Fullerton will man the Enterprise for its first free flight. Of the scheduled series of free flights, two are considered the most critical. This flight and a later one for which the turbulence reducing tail cone will be removed. Free flight one will test the separation, the handling qualities of the orbiter, and certain systems will be evaluated, including braking and steering during rollout. Now the 747 is near the altitude required for the pushover maneuver. The crew of the Orbiter Enterprise is completing its pre-flight checklist. Due to buffeting, the ship vibrates, causing the astronauts' voices to shake. We're on 202. CSS. CSS, they're steady. Surface is steady. Okay, I'm all set to push over. Get the cameras at the wideband and then the arm at 240. Okay, Enterprise is uh, set. Thanks to the left, that's 905 and Enterprise Houston is go for pushover. 905. Copy the launch heading. Houston copies. Two, one, pushover. Houston copies pushover. The carrier aircraft has pushed over and acceleration begins. The orbiter pilot will arm a series of explosive bolts and when separation speed is reached, the commander will fire the bolts, releasing the orbiter. An orbiter pitch-up maneuver will provide vertical separation and the 747 will turn left while the orbiter turns right 
for horizontal separation. Then the crew of the Enterprise will be on their own, okay, flying to an unpowered landing on the dry lake bed. 220, 235, 240, mark. Arm, no lights, two lights. Okay, we are armed, two lights, and the orbiters go. 250, Houston is go for set, have a great flight. And we're stand by for the bang, Gardo. Power. Stand by. Wasn't too bad. Now. At separation, computer number two stops processing data. The other general processing computers or GPCs in the redundant system voted off the line. The crew informs the control center, executes the planned computer malfunction procedures, and free flight one continues. Okay, pitch up. We're up. Got a okay, got a computer light, it's number two. Okay, we got a GPC light, loss of sync on two, pushing over. And a big X on computer number two. Roger, we understand. Roger. Okay, I guess, yeah. okay she's flying good. 250, starting flare. Okay, your AA breakers are coming out. And we're going to get a message. Yeah, that's a definite lurch. Sideways lurch, just like you said. Okay, uh, K11 Alpha, pushing over. Okay, I got your 195 and 20,000. Oh. You got it, Gordo. I got your plan. Okay, straight. Okay. Enterprise, you're cleared to start to turn. Okay, Gordo's in the turn. Oh. It is really tight, uh, Bo. In fact, I think it's a little uh, better than the old uh, TA field. Yeah, the lurch is there, just like everybody said. Okay. Altitude's on, and uh, I'm about 14 lower than you are in speed and right on altitude. The orbiter is not controlled so can, like uh, a standard airplane. The onboard computer system, using information provided by flight sensing devices, makes constant adjustments to the control surfaces so that a stable attitude is maintained. When the pilot moves the control stick, the signal goes first to the computer system. The computers instantly adjust the control surfaces so that while the pilot's command is obeyed, stable flight is maintained. If the weather is bad and visibility poor, the orbiter can be flown in an autoland mode. In autoland, the orbiter is brought to a landing by the computer, which determines its location, direction, and speed through its inertial guidance system, its microwave landing system, and other data sources. Got a steady autoland. 900. Arm. Okay, we are armed and flaring. Standing by the gear. 200 feet, 290. Okay, the gear is coming down at 270. Coming down. Mark. Gear coming. Doors open and they're all down, coming down. Look down here. 50 okay, feet. three down. Gear's down. 40 240. 230. 20, 220, 15, lots of speed. 10. Beautiful. Holding 10. 210. 220, about 5 feet. 10. 4 feet. 200. 3 feet. 2 feet. 195. Just over the last about 2 feet. 185. You're on. You're on. Okay. Speed brakes. Speed brakes are coming. Speed brakes are half, halfway up. We'll see you, babe. Okay, I got 130 knots. Yeah, it's great. 120. Little runner. 115, uh, K80. Okay, 60 knots. Try the nose well. Okay, that was too good a glider. Free flight time, okay. 5 minutes and 22 seconds. Roll out with moderate braking, a little over 2 miles. It's a lot better than the OAS. Look at that. Yeah. Free flights 2 and 3 have furnished additional engineering data. Required adjustments have been made to Orbiter 101 systems. Now, astronauts Joe Engel and Dick Truly will make free flight number four, the first flight with the tail cone off. When an orbiter returns from space, it will not carry a tail cone. This will cause increased turbulence behind the craft and will create more air drag. During this critical flight with the tail cone off, the tail section of the 747 will receive even greater punishment from the turbulence. But if all goes well, the 150,000 pound Enterprise will be released and will descend 20,000 feet in two and a half minutes.
First, the mated vehicles are checked in flight with the orbiter's tail cone off. A data run is made to monitor performance at separation speed. Then the 747 begins its climb for pushover and actual separation. Enterprise has two lights, we're go for set. Roger, Enterprise, Houston is go for set, go for set. Okay, Dick, let's do it pretty. 210 knots, 220 knots, 230 knots. Stand by for launch ready, Joe. Okay. Set. Okay. Coming up. Body flap set. Good. Okay, pushing over. Okay. Okay, Joe, we're configured. Beautiful. 180 knots. Free flight four is going well. Got it. Instrumentation set. and power set. systems are okay. performing normally. Carrier aircraft buffeting was within the established limits before separation. And during free flight, the orbiter's handling qualities are not noticeably different than they were with the tail cone on. 285 knots, you're looking good. 290 knots, 4,000 feet. 3,000 feet, 290, you're a little fast. Joe. Leave them, leave them out. Pre -blair. You're on the glide slope, we see you on the glide slope. Want the speed brakes coming in. Negative, leave them. Okay, now starting in. Okay, they're coming in. Speed brakes closing. Orbiter gear. Okay. Get the gear. Gear's coming. Okay, 200 feet, Joe, 260 knots. Good. 250 knots. 240 knots. 230 knots. 10 feet. 220 knots. 5 feet. 4 feet. 10 knots. 200 knots. 190 knots. Down. Speed brakes are tracking. Oh, is coming down? Two feet. One foot. Down. Bricks. Back up. On. Nose wheel steering on. Off. Differential braking. Your brakes, Dick. Okay. I've got the brakes. Push them hard. Okay. Okay. Okay, let me get a little slower here, Joe. Okay, I'm coming off the brakes, okay. on the right brake. Okay, I'm coming in slow. Come on, brake. I'm holding what I got. Okay. Okay, Houston, we're stopped. Mark. Glad you got it. Look good Thank for you, here. Thank you, Richard. That was a super one. Free flight time, two minutes and 35 seconds. Roll out with hard braking. 5,275 feet. The orbiter flies well with the tail cone off. On this flight, free flight five, the orbiter will land on a paved runway. The performance of the landing gear and its connected airframe systems must be verified on this type of surface. Also, the orbiter's approach, landing, and rollout will be tested on the paved strip with a simulated 10,000-foot length. The Kennedy Space Center runway, where the orbiter will normally land as it returns from space, is 15,000 feet, and the additional 5,000 feet will mean a greater margin of safety. Free Flight 5 goes well until just before touchdown. Then a pilot-induced movement takes the vehicle close to the ground. It rises. At 187 knots, it touches down, but skips off the ground and settles 1,900 feet later to a second touchdown. The total runway rollout distance from the first touchdown point is 7,930 feet, well under the 10,000-foot mark. With Free Flight 5, the approach and landing tests are concluded. All of the assigned program requirements have been satisfactorily completed. Now Orbiter 101 will go to Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama for a series of ground vibration tests. In 1979, the 747 will carry Orbiter 102, sister ship of the Enterprise, to Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where it will be the first vehicle to be used in the orbital flight tests. Shuttle Orbiter is designed to be used at least 100 times. 
the space shuttle fleet will handle a variety of missions. Placing, servicing, or recovering satellites in orbit. Delivering deep space probes for on-orbit launch. Carrying space laboratories. NASA's space transportation system will replace nearly all expendable launch vehicles for both civilian and military space missions. With the shuttle orbiters, we're entering a new era in space.